setting apart leaders. We have servant leaders in our church. We call them deacons, and we're setting them apart. We're having ordination services. There's one this morning at Anastasia Elkton. There's going to be one this evening, 6 o'clock here for the deacons, the new deacons that are going to be uh, ordained here for this campus, 6 o'clock. All of y'all are invited. Uh, there's food afterwards, by the way. Um, <clears throat> Not ribs for the, like the guys, but you know, we got food. And then uh, next week at Anastasia 16, we're going to be uh, uh, ordaining some more deacons. God's doing amazing things here. Life groups are just, are just going. They're going to be a connection group. How many of you are in a life group here? Any of you here in a life group? Yeah, if you're not in a life group, look at one of these people that has their hands, hands uh, raised and just sort of say, hey, uh, tell me about this life group. Maybe I can go to that life group because it's very, very helpful. It's a great way to leverage your church participation in growing and connecting with people. You can go and you can talk with other people rather than just having to listen to one person talk. You know, it is really good. So I just encourage you to go to life groups. And uh, also I want to encourage you to open your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 14 and as you're turning let me tell you something that's happening in two weeks we're gonna have missions weekend here we're gonna have James Peoples going to be he's a, a former president of the Florida Baptist Convention he's someone with the North American Mission Board he's gonna be speaking here but there is going to be a missions fair out in that atrium and I want you to prepare your hearts now because that missions fair is not just to tell you what kind of ministries we're involved in out in the community. It's to show you some ways that you can be out in the community, being the salt and light that God's called you to do. So in the next couple of weeks, would you pray about how God would be using you to share the gospel in a very practical way, in a very real way with the, our community, and think about how you can be involved in some of those ministries that are going to be here in one week, I, in two weeks. Because I believe God, God is going to do great things through some of you people here. Amen? Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles, Romans 14. We are, we're in the home stretch of the book of Romans. This last section of Romans, we're calling it Renewed, because from Romans 12 to 16, Paul is telling us what it means to have this renewed life in Christ. I'm a new creature in Christ. Isn't that great? You're a new creature in Christ. And, and, and that means that we're new creatures, but we're still living in this world. And he told us in Romans 12 how our relationship with God is. It's new, okay? We're not going to be conformed to this world anymore. We're going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. He told us what our relationship is with the body of Christ. We're a part of the body. We all have a function. We we'll all have a purpose here. He told us how we need to relate to people who try to hurt us, people outside of church, people that try to persecute us. And, and remember he said, leave the vengeance to God. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And then he told us how to relate to our governmental authorities, how to relate to uh, how to be a new, renewed person in a political world. Last week, Pastor Don, our uh, senior adult pastor, he gave that message on, on what it means to have that operating system for a renewed life. That operating system is the love of Christ. It operates everything. It makes everything work together. And then uh, today, what I want to talk about is a very important subject, because you may not realize this, but did you know that in churches, sometimes there are Christians that cannot get along with other Christians? Yeah, I know you're surprised. I'm shocked too. I've heard about this before. But there are Christians that don't get along with, with other Christians. And these are people that are godly people on both sides. And some of those, some of those differences are differences that they hold very closely because they think that they're, they're differences of faith and very important. So I want to talk about renewed life in a divided world. In all honesty, a renewed life in the context of divided churches. So would you please stand with me in honor of God's word. Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 1, this is what Paul wrote, the word of God. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls. And he'll be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another. 
while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us will give an account of himself to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these very powerful words, Lord, these, these very important words. And Lord, help us to glean them. Help us to take them just personally and apply to today's life. In your precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Paul was talking to Christians in Rome. Uh, there was a church there, and, and it was a, a church that, that was dealing with some arguments. This was actually saying, stop quarreling among yourself. And, and in this, I, I'm grateful that Paul gave us some instruction on how to deal with these kinds of things. And the first thing he says in verse 1, in verse 1 he says not to quarrel over opinions. That we need to understand the things that are biblical truth and the things that are opinion. We need to have some wisdom to understand the difference. You know, a division in the church is nothing new. We have it today. Uh, we had it in the very early churches. I mean, the Church of Rome, this is just 25 years after the crucifixion and resurrection. But you know, there's already, there's division in the Church of Ga uh, Galatia, there's um, division in the churches of the Corinthians, you hear about it in James, you hear it all throughout the New Testament that there are churches where there are people that because we don't have all the information about everything, God gave us everything we need to know, but we don't have everything that we suppose about, and people start making arguments and discussions. And in Rome, it wasn't any different. It was a mix of people. Some of the people that were in that church of Rome, they were strong Christians, and they were of the Hebrew faith. And they were strong in the Hebrew faith. And they saw how beautifully that, that Jesus Christ had come to fulfill the law of Moses. And so when they celebrated and observed the Sabbath, and when they celebrated the high holy days, and, and when they kept those dietary laws, it was reminding them how God was faithful. And they just embraced their Hebrew faith as new Christians. And then you had other people. And they were strong followers of Christ who were also of the Hebrew faith. But what they found was this newfound freedom. They found that, hey, God loves me apart from the law. God loves me despite uh, the fact that I'm a sinner. And I don't have to do this level of perfection in order to gain his acceptance. He loves me. And they were just embracing that and all that that was. And, and they felt strongly that the rules could be a hindrance of faith to them. They embraced the fact that they, as, as Jewish Christians, Hebrew Christians, could actually sit at a table and have fellowship with non-Jewish people and eat that BLT sandwich, <laughs> bacon, lettuce, and tomatoes, if it was offered to them. And they embraced that new fellowship and that freedom that they had in Christ. And they could go to the market and buy meat, even though they knew that Buying meat in a market in Rome back in that day meant that probably somewhere along that butchering process, a pagan god's name had been invoked. And they sort of said, well, you know, that's not, that, that, those aren't real gods. I'm not even going to worry about that. And, and, and there are people that said, no, I'm not going to eat that meat. I don't want to have any part of that. So, so there were these discussions. So there are these two types of Christians. And then there was a third type of Christian. These were new Christians. And these were Gentiles, and they had never been Jewish before. And you had one group telling them, well, you got to be Jewish to be Christian. Another one said, no, 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 don't do that, just be Christian. And so you had these three groups in this church that we know about, and, uh, and it was kind of confusing. They didn't have the book of Acts yet. Acts hadn't been written yet. So they know about Acts chapter 10 and what Peter saw in that vision before he went to Cornelius in, in Acts chapter 10. So they didn't have that. The book of Galatians 
which talks about this issue. It had been written six or seven years earlier, but you need to understand that back in that day, some people didn't think Paul was really even an apostle. And so not everybody accepted his authority. So they didn't have any scriptural stuff. And in Jewish, and Jesus never taught how, how, how Jewish should a Christian be. He never addressed this in, in the Gospels. And this was the big, the big controversy of that day. It went on for years and years and years. How Jewish should a Christian be? Now we know that the writings of Paul are scripture. The church has said these are scripture. We know this inspired word of God. And, and Paul gives some good instruction here. And here's what he says. First of all, he says in verse 1, build fellowship in Christ by promoting faith, not opinion. Promote faith, not opinion. Sometimes, sometimes we want to pro, uh, promote our own opinions and the things that we really like more than anything else, but, but we need to be promoting that biblical truth, that faith, and we need to understand the difference. Uh, late in the 1980s, Elise and I were starting a church. We did a church plant in, southern, in South Fort Worth, and uh, it was in this apartment complex, and there was one guy I really wanted to get with, really wanted to talk with him about spiritual things, get him out of the context of that apartment complex. And so I took him to a uh, Major League Baseball game. We went and saw the Texas Rangers play uh, over there in Arlington. And uh, we went there, had a good time, had some good discussions, some good spiritual discussions, some good building up time. And I came back to the apartment complex. The next day, a fella came up to me and he said, you know, I knew you took this guy to the, the baseball game. Do you realize that Christians should not be going to Major League Baseball games? I told him I was not aware of that. I hadn't gotten to that part in the Bible yet. <laughs> uh, you know, but here, here's the back story. This guy had a past, and his past was that he struggled with alcoholism and drinking too much beer. And when he went to Major League Baseball games, he would get drunk. And that was a stumbling block for him. And so he knew that he couldn't go to a Major League Baseball game. That was a huge temptation for him. And he had sort of generalized that, well, that should be how all Christians are. Shouldn't go to that, so you're not going to stumble into that, that sin uh, and, and that temptation of alcoholism. And, uh, and so he blurred the line between opinion and faith. And, you know, we can do that as well. Um, you know, in this practice of faith, we need to understand what are things that are, that are working for me and what are things that apply to all Christians. And let me share with you that the only eternal wins uh, are those eternal wins based on faith in Jesus Christ. The only, only wins of salvation come from trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know, in my lifetime, uh, I'm 55 years old, I'll be 56 in a month, I, I've seen several controversies that, that have been raging in churches in my lifetime. One in the 70s, the big thing in churches it seemed like, well there's this controversy and division among churches about the work of the Holy Spirit. And some people would say these gifts are, are, are not valid today and some people were, were saying yes they are. As a matter of fact God has given them to me and they were using them to the glory of God. And they were, they were, there were these really uh, hostile sort of things going on with the gifts of the Spirit. Well let me just say to you we don't need to argue about stuff like that. If God has given you the power and the motivation and the conviction to, to do something, just do it. Go with the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't argue about, let God empower and use you, and don't argue about when God's empowering using other people. Just be open to the Holy Spirit working with you. Another uh, division I've seen in churches in my lifetime has been this division between the style of music in churches. And there are churches that I'm grateful that we don't deal with that here, you know? That we don't deal with people that are arguing about what style of worship music you're going to have. If you like this one, come here. If you like that one, go there. You know, but, but you don't have to argue about it. And, and you don't have to say, well, this one's more holy and this one's not more holy. This one reaches people, this one doesn't. Let me tell you what, I know that there are people in that room across the way at the traditional service that they don't like the style of music that's going on in here. But I've noticed that some of you don't like their music either right? So we don't need to argue about music. Let's just worship the Lord, and let's not argue over these things that are opinion that have nothing to do with faith. Another, uh, another controversy that people talk about from time to time is predestination, okay? 
predestination. And, and there are Christians that will argue about whether God has particularly named certain people to go to heaven and certain people to go to hell before the foundation of the world or whether everyone really has an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And there are Christians that argue about that. What I want to say, don't argue about that because, first of all, that's not your job. It is not your job about who's going to go to heaven and who's not going to go to heaven. You have a job. Share Jesus and leave that to God. Okay? We don't need to be divided over things like this. Okay? Because there's only one dividing line. There's one dividing line. There are people that are redeemed, who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they have eternal destiny in heaven, life forever with Jesus in heaven. Okay, they got eternal life. And there are people whom God dearly loves, for whom Christ died for, who have not trusted him yet. And those people, if they don't have Christ by the time they die, they're going to hell. Okay, that's the dividing line that really matters. And everything else is microscopically minuscule in comparison. So let, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let's tell people about Jesus. Let, let's let the Holy Spirit work in us to share about what Jesus can do in a person's life and not have arguments about things that really don't matter in the eternal scheme of things. When you get to heaven, we're not going to be arguing about what kind of music is around the throne room of God. We're just going to be praising Him, right? Okay. Okay, good. You got that? Let's look at the next thing. Verses 2 and 3. Paul's talking about let not the one who eats, that's... Uh, eating the meat, sacrificed at idols, despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. You know, when you have this conviction and you're going to do something and you say, I think that this is the right way, and another says that's the right way. When we say that's the right way, we can get this idea that we're a little bit superior. We're a little bit more devoted. We're a little bit more holy than other people. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Because if we're superior, then we can pass judgment. We can withhold or give fellowship based on our, as though we think it's our choice. And somehow we get this idea that we're qualified to judge other people's faith. Let me ask you to write this down. We need to dump the trip advisor model for faith relationships. Okay? Just dump the trip advisor. You know what I'm talking about, trip advisor? You know, they rate everything. There's five stars and everything or five circles or whatever like that. And it's great for picking out restaurants. You want to see what people like. They got this restaurant or, 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 or hotels. But it is terrible for choosing fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. You don't, you don't do that sort of thing. We are so into five-star ratings and we're so into likes and dislikes. You know, we're listed on Google, and so there are people who go on. They'll give us five-star, three-star, one-star, whatever they like, whatever their experience was here. Let me tell you something. Fellowship and faith is not based on five-star ratings. And here's why. There are no five-star Christians. Okay, there's no one that's a five-star Christian that could adequately be the right judge. And there are no five-star churches. And God has granted no one on earth the power nor the permission to rate each other. Nowhere is that in the Bible. Now, God has not given you that permission. Google has. God hasn't. You decide who you're going to follow. Okay? You know, if it's me, if I, want, if I want someone to attend a church, they're going to look it up on Google. And I know that church is teaching the Bible. I know that church is going to connect people and so they're going to grow in faith. I think I'm just going to give them a five-star rating to encourage them. But I'm not going to start saying, well, this one's a five and this one's a three and this one's a two. And I, I'm not going to do that. I think it's a very dangerous thing to do. Because I know by the standard by which you judge, you will be judged, right? And so here's what I think, I, and I challenge you. You know, if you do those things, you do those review things, I say, you don't go up to, to Crescent Beach Baptist Church Google site and give them a five-star rating, because I know the pastor there. He preaches the Word of God, and people come to know the Lord, and they grow in faith. And you ought to go to Ancient City Baptist Church. I know Fred Pitts, the pastor there, he does the same thing. But also, I know Josh Hersey over at Church on the Rock. You need to do the same thing there and over at Homeport Church and, uh, and Reverb Church up in World Golf Village. They are knocking it out of the park. And Good News Church, any church that's teaching the Word of God, and any church, by the way, that has the name Anastasia on the front, give them a five-star rating too. 
But don't get in this, don't get in this trap, this trap of saying, well, I can rate this church better than that church or this Christian better than that Christian. That's a very dangerous place to be. Don't fall into that trap, okay? Let's, let's dump that TripAdvisor model. If you're going to use that to encourage people, just encourage them. If you can't say anything, just don't say anything at all. I learned that when I, was, when I can't say something nice, just don't say something at all, okay? So dump that, okay? The next thing I see here is verse, um, verse 1. He says, as for the one who is weak in faith, what do we do? We welcome him. We welcome that person in. Why? Because it says in verse 3, because God has welcomed him. And so we have this welcoming, uh, this welcoming uh, posture toward people. And that word, to welcome, it means to accept, it means to receive. But the way it's written here in the original language, it has this intensity to it. And so it means to warmly embrace somebody coming in. So it says, for the one that's weak in the faith, that person that, that you don't agree with, Welcome them in any way. Just embrace them because God's embraced them. They're your brother and sister in Christ. Yeah, if they go to a church of a different name and denomination, embrace them. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and here's, the, here's the principle here. Write this down. Embrace all the people that God embraces. If God doesn't embrace them, you don't have to embrace them. But who does God embrace? <laughs> he loves the world. He gave his only begotten son for the world. Embrace all the people that God embraces. There's no litmus test to determine degrees of faith to whom you're going to fellowship with and whom you're not going to. And we need to welcome. You know, I think we've lost a sense of welcome ritual in our culture. You know, I went to India uh, earlier this year and it was just amazing. Anywhere we went, anywhere we went, the host would come They'd sit us down in a room. They would prepare some hot tea and a little savory treat to eat, a little snack to eat. Every time we went somewhere, and when we're up there, there's the Boro tribe that's most in most of these churches. They would come and put a scarf around us, and they'd say, we want to welcome you in the way that we welcome people in our culture. And they'd say that over and over again, and I thought, how do we welcome people in the culture? I think we've lost that. We don't welcome people. What we do is we... When they knock, knock on the door, we look through the peephole or through the camera, decide whether we're going to open it. We don't welcome people. We look at the phone number that's coming in, deciding whether we're going to answer it or not. I want you to know, I call people on their birthdays. If you're in a database, call them birthdays. I want you to know, it used to be when, when you answer the phone, people would say, hello. They don't do that anymore, you know. If they don't recognize the phone number, you know what they'll say? What do you want? Who is this? And say it kind of harshly, I'm thinking, man, how would it, would it hurt anything for a Christian to say, hello, how are you? Does that really hurt you? And even if it's a telemarketer, they could probably use a hello and a, and a bridge to Christ. You know, I'm thinking we've lost that sense of welcome in our community. And we need to learn to, to gain that back again. And we need to embrace all the people that God embraces. That person on the other end of the phone, that person on the other side of the door, God died for them, Christ died for them too. Okay, next thing. Uh, verses 5 and 6, uh, there's some principles here. And he's talking about each one needs to be fully convinced. The person who esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days, that's whether you, whether you go with the Sabbath observances or not, okay? And he says you should be fully convinced in your mind what you're going to do. The one who observes, uh, who uh, does it, you should do it in honor of the Lord. And then it says the one who eats the meat, eat it in honor of the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. The one who's not, abstain, fast from that in honor of the Lord. But here are the things that get us past the dividing lines. It's the idea that everything we do is to honor the Lord and we need to be consistent with our convictions. Okay? If you feel like this is strong and this is, this is something that's very important, live in consistency with those convictions you feel like God has given you in those particular areas, those areas where the Bible doesn't speak very directly. Live with your convictions. Don't live a life uh, where you believe one thing and do another. But do it to honor the Lord, not to, not to lift yourself up. Do it to build the body of Christ, not to divide the body of Christ. And do it in a spirit of gratitude. So I want you to write this down. In gratitude, live 100% to honor the Lord. 
Live 100% to honor the Lord. 100% fully convicted, following the convictions of your mind and pointing all praise and glory and honor to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? That's what we do. So these are some great principles he's given us. You know, build fellowship in Christ by promoting faith. Dump the TripAdvisor model for faith relationships. Embrace all the people that God is embracing. And in gratitude, live 100% to honor the Lord. And the most important principle I find in verses 10 and 11, it says this, completely surrender to Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord, and Judge. He's our Savior, He's our Lord, and He's our Judge. True fellowship it begins and ends with Jesus Christ. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And I want you to know, if someone makes that decision to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord, if, if someone responds to Christ in faith so that they receive the forgiveness of sins that comes by trusting in Jesus for that forgiveness, believing that he died on the cross for us and he raised again to prove that power, if you do that, I want you to know you've crossed from death into life. That's the dividing line. And if you cross from death into life, you're my brother. You're my sister. You're brother with everybody else here in this, in this place that's a follower of Christ. In a minute, we're going to have a time of invitation. We're going to sing a song. And if you need Jesus as Lord of your life, you need Jesus to forgive your sins, I invite you to come and cross over the line. Everything else is minuscule in comparison. But the reality is, sometimes these things divide us from each other. And when that dividing happens, we got to bridge the gap. Now, I want you to know during this time, there may be somebody in this room that you've not embraced in a long time. There might be somebody in this room that you have made sure you did not shake hands with that person because there's something that separated you. I want you to know whatever separated you is minuscule compared to what unites us in Christ. And I just invite you either to take this time to let the Holy Spirit lead you in taking a step to restore. The Holy Spirit lead you to come forward to pray for people divided. You might know of a church that's divided. You might know of other people that are estranged from each other. Let's let God work because he can overcome all of this. He can break everything. He can restore everything that's broken, excuse me. And he can do it in a way that just glorifies his name and shows his righteous power. You ready to let God work? Let's let God work. Let's stand right now. If God's calling you, you come. You come. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Real Life, Real Hope. I'm Walter West, lead pastor of Anastasia Baptist Church. And our mission as a church is to help people embrace the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. And that includes you. Christ has a purpose for your life. He has a mission for your life. He wants you to be reconciled with himself. He has a destiny for you. You know, if you want to find out more about that destiny, I invite you to contact us. You can find Anastasia Baptist Church online at www.anastasiachurch.org. Or you can find us uh, uh, locally in the St. Augustine, Florida area. We'd love for you to come by and see us personally. Or you can call us by telephone. It's area code 904-471-2166. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, God bless you.